All right, for the next talk, we have Eric, and uh, he's going to talk about solving the no internet problem. Another thing that scares me. So. Okay. Spoiler alert. No. Uh, I've been working in public health overseas in uh, Botswana, uh, conducting clinical trial research in HIV AIDS using electronic, as academics like to call it, uh, data systems in remote areas of Botswana and doing that despite having not necessarily no internet but no reliable internet. Uh, just a little bit about Botswana, it's a middle income country, landlocked in southern Africa, population now just over two million. And it is landmass about the same size as Texas and although a bit drier in the drier parts of Texas that it kind of looks the same. Uh, that's me at the last PyCon I was at in Namibia last year. I'm the f former director of data operations and IT, so it's a pretty broad um, job of the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute. Uh, I had a data management and IT teams there for over 25 NIH funded clinical trials. And during that time, we developed uh, clinical trial data management systems, laboratory information systems, and interface some of the analytical laboratory equipment. And right now, I'm finishing up a trial that, oddly enough, I'm running from the cloud, uh, which is uh, we're enrolling people in Botswana, Malawi, uh, Uganda, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. And I'm not a medical person, um, but I've been surrounded by them for, for a lot of years now. Uh, clinical research in HIV AIDS, so this is an academic endeavor. Um, our investigators and research teams were built from, or made up of international and local um, people. Um, our work is funded by competitive grants, um, almost exclusively from the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S. Um, all of our trials were conducted in Botswana. Um, I worked for Max Essex at Harvard, and being a virologist that he is, all of our um, trials were, had a heavy laboratory component. So um, in, included in collecting all the data, we also collected um, probably a little bit over 600,000 blood specimens um, to go with that. A little bit about HIV AIDS in Botswana. Um, the, I, I'm sure you know, well, I would say that the real, oops, excuse me, the real problem is not no internet, the real problem is um, the HIV epidemic. Um, you probably know a lot about it, you also probably know about the epidemic even starting here in the 80s, but that was followed with a heterosexual epidemic in, in Africa. And in Botswana, around 1995, even though it already had started ramping up, um, it was very clear that there was a very serious epidemic underway. Um, and by 2000, estimates were that 15 to 20 percent of the population was infected, which is amazing. Um, life expectancy in Botswana was around 70 years and had dropped or expected to drop to around 40. And there were projections from the McKinsey Group that um, population of Botswana, which at that time was about 1.2 million, would half within the next 10 to 15 years if nothing was done. So in 2000, the president of Botswana stood in front of the UN and basically stated that his population is looking at extinction if nothing is done. Um, we had already started um, in a trial funded by the NIH and um, Bristol Miles Squibb Bristol Meyer Squibb, where we were um, looking at ways of rolling out already approved adult treatment, and that sort of merged in 2002 into a national program, which meant that the government agreed to then fund um, free treatment, testing, monitoring, whatever was necessary to get people um, onto the drugs that were then available. And that program, which still continues today, is the probably the most successful one in the world at the moment for combating HIV. So now to shift over a little bit about clinical trial data management. Yeah, someone said to me, don't worry, I won't ever need that data, but we always do. Um, 
before I get into the solutions of what we did for offline use, to take a few minutes just to talk about clinical trial data management so that you can appreciate why, given limited resources and so on, why don't we just keep it simple and, and flip back to paper, because um, paper works. But um, So my role in all of this was to um, support the research trials with data management. And like I said, we built these laboratory information systems already where we're receiving um, resulting uh, specimens, storing the specimens, interfacing laboratory equipment, and we built data management systems. This is prior to data management systems and filing paper and um, all kinds of stuff like that for the research clinics that we are currently working with. But paper is very difficult to work with, and if you're dealing with large trials, you start to trip over it. It's bulky, it's hard to change, data can't be validated in real time. You need to transcribe information, which has a, 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 a fixed sort of 10% error rate. You've got to store the paper, and then when you want to do quality assurance or you're trying to prepare for um, some sort of interim or final analysis, you've got to drag those papers back out and make corrections, send them back to the clinic. Um, then get them back into your data center, transcribe them again, store them, and this process just goes on forever. And it turns out that what will happen is you get to some point in your trial where you want to do analysis and you can take 8 to 12 months to prepare a data set. And very often these trials are underfunded. You ask for $10, you get 6 kind of thing. So no matter what, you cannot afford to have these long lag times um, for data preparation and when you get to the end of a trial you're probably out of money already anyway so having to say oh we need another 12 months of staffing to work on a data set it's not going to be um, something you want to do plus you got a lot of pressure to publish to because um, that is in some ways the main deliverable so in 2010 I introduced to my team um, Python and Django I looked at other things but I decided to do that and we then got underway to develop um, basically data collection that we would do at point of care. Um, and our main metric was to say, okay, if we say you want to freeze a data set for analysis, how long is it going to take from that moment to the point where we can actually do, a fine, do an analysis? And we got that down from that 8 to 12 month thing down to, in our last one, just a couple weeks. So we tried this system out um, on one trial. Uh, we call them a Bona trial. This was looking at trying to completely block transmission from a mother to a child. It was a successful trial. We were able to show, do that. Um, but it was, we deployed this within clinics, our research clinics, so it's a very comfortable turf. And we had control of the environment. We were able to install connections and uh, data connections and so on. But then we had another trial, which was just a small one, which we did in a neighboring village where we, um, where we had to go into people's households. That actually is a picture of somebody's household. Um, and that was different because now it's not our turf. We're actually operating in somebody's house, kick us out, and we can't sit there. And Anyway, and there wasn't good um, data connection there. And we, the group tried to do this on paper. And within a few weeks, about six weeks, the whole thing collapsed because the handling the paper just became a nightmare. You're collecting longitudinal data. You're collecting data from one household over a number of days. Um, and it just, it just became a nightmare. So we had to stop the trial and finish uh, and kind of come up with another solution. The solution was our first iteration of offline use. We had learned something already from um, making uh, from the Mabana trial with um, how to do electronic data connection and um, data collection and management um, and we tried um, some offline use. Then in 2012 we got a grant for about, uh, it was a large grant, about 80 million US which um, you, you don't see that much on the ground but that was the total apparently. Um, and since it was so large, State Department and CDC got involved as well. <clears throat> the trial brought together a lot of what we as data managers or our data manager team already had experience in now. We knew how to do real-time data collection, real-time validation. We knew how to do the sort of the, uh, the informed consent process, how to handle HIV testing data, treatment data, how to do blood collection, chain of custody, um, and all kinds of uh, questionnaires for men, women, um, and so on. 
uh, regulatory compliance, how to protect personal information through encryption and things like that. We knew how to do all this, but this trial was different in that it wanted, we wanted to operate in 30 extremely remote villages with distances of, I'll say kilometers, but you know, 700 kilometers away and things like that from where we were, we were sitting. So this is a different, um, this is different. So what was the current state of internet in Botswana at that time? So in 2009, 3G was introduced, but they just focused on the major city centers and the amount of bandwidth that they could actually handle on those 3G connections was pretty poor. It's more, mostly about like Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing, not really trying to do anything. And they're always really lopsided. You can bring a lot of data in, but you can't push data up. So you, you would prefer something symmetrical. But fixed line penetration, it's only about 10% in the country, so that's also no good. <clears throat> the cost of a gigabyte, around $70 per gigabyte, so that's pretty heavy. Uh, we weren't really sure what kind of data throughput we would have. Um, and so we also looked at satellite, like $5 a megabyte or something like that, but there's also the complexity of dealing with satellite. Because we were thinking in terms of trying to do something in real time, because that's what we were working with. We had these systems that worked really well but they were online, so um, we wanted to see if we could work with real time. I put into the budget a pretty big, trying to work with this five bucks a megabyte satellite thing, but when we started to have discussions and the CDC moved in, they said, oh, by the way, this internet budget, can we remove that? Because we need that money for something else. I had a lot of arguments with a lot of people to explain that, you know, no matter what anybody tells you, <clears throat> 3G is not going to support this. Anyway, time went on into 2013, and 30 days before we, um, we started the trial, we had already written our solution to operate sort of offline. They decided, oh my gosh, because they had a component of the trial that they were responsible for, they wanted internet. So they suddenly came up with a lot of money and started helping us put up towers like this. And we, would, we had 30 villages, there were two uh, two, um, we're doing a um, comparative trial, so we had a control and a, an intervention sites, and we were, so there's 15 and 15, so we would go two sites at a time, and we built these right before we got to the next pair. These were being built, and so we walked along the country like this. Um, but these connections, as expensive as they were, um, uh, we put half a million dollars into building these, or they did, um, and and uh, recurring costs of like $50,000. But we're looking at one megabit per second is all we could sustain, which is okay for SSH and things like that, but it was one megabit, hopefully. It, a lot of, most of the time during the day it was unusable and at the, only at night could it be usable. So still not a solution to real time data collection. So what did we do? So all we really are doing, we came up with an offline solution, and it's pretty simple. I'm not, spoiler alert, there's no magic to not having internet. You don't have internet, you don't have internet, and, or you don't have a data connection, Wi-Fi, there's no solution to that. But, you know, through asynchronous sort of approach, you can, you can come up with something. So we're using Django systems, and so we've got a database. If we can, um, first thing we do is we would we wrote some a little bit to, we added to each of our system a, a new model, an outgoing transaction model, so a single model, and then we would also have an incoming transaction model, sort of taking a, almost like mail, inbox, outbox. And all of the uh, models within, um, within the system for each of the questionnaires and forms and so on would all serialize into a, each time you would hit a save method, they would sync, serialize into an outgoing transaction that transaction at some point would be, all those transactions at some point coming out of that outgoing transaction model would be dumped into a file. The file then, when we had some availability of some sort, would be uh, SCP to cross to a remote machine, which would, um, and then reverse it. Read the file back in, deserialize all the transactions, and everything works. And as long as we maintain the order of how they played out originally and then just play them back, everything is fine. 
So what we had were, in some cases, we would have 30 or 40 research assistants fan out into a village. Each one has a Mac Air. They would go out for about four hour shifts because they're also collecting blood. They have to come back with their blood to what we had was a, a community server, which is still not connected to any remote system. They would connect to a local Wi-Fi. We had a little Wi-Fi unit right there and they would connect to a MacBook, push in all, um, move in all of their transactions and um, at some point, maybe in the night or in a few days, that community server would do the same thing and push all its transactions to a headquarters server. So let's look at some, some code. So we have an installable application, Django Collect Offline, which since these are Django applications, you would um, put in your installed app, you migrate, you'll get those two tables, the outgoing transaction table and the incoming transaction table or model. Um, those models simply have one field for the, the serialized JSON and then some metadata for the administration around that, that transaction. And the incoming model is exactly the same, um, just um, on the other end. So to prepare a model for offline use, if you have a model like this one, I think is out of the Django tutorial or something like that. Um, I just added a report date time because we're always using that and I have my own little uh, utility package which uses, uh, I'm always working with um, time zone aware dates and for that, um, anyway. Then you have, because you're going to serialize, you have to have a, a unique um, constraint on at least one field or combination of fields. Um, I was just going to say for the um, date time stuff, I use the arrow package, would recommend that. So now, and this is pretty much, you can follow this pretty well in the, and well described in the Django documentation. You're preparing a model for serialization, so you have to add, well what we did was we would make sure we would switch from a integer primary key to a, a UUID so we wouldn't get any clashes. Um, and that's now has become part of Django, so you can use that, but pr previously it wasn't. Um, add a custom managers um, plus the natural key so you can do the full circle of serializing and deserializing. So that would be a model and this will, we can, you can also um, add foreign keys or in Django you have the sort of many to many. I don't know how many people are familiar with Django. So we, it'll support all that kind of stuff. Then the next thing is to um, add an offline models module in your app and that's just where you're going to register which models you want to um, include in this process. You don't have to include every model. Um, you can either register them explicitly in that offline models PY or you could be safer if you want the whole application and all its models to, to um, to be a part of this, then you just register with the, the app name. And that module will be discovered on boot up, just like uh, if you're familiar with Django, Django has an admin, um, has admin classes and when you boot up, the system looks for an admin's PY and registers any classes in there. This uses the same, the same approach, some of the same code. So that as soon as you boot up, it'll look for that and it'll have a, um, a, a global, site offline global that will, you can refer to later in the registry. And then the last thing is some sort of post save signal. So once, every time you, for any model that's registered, if you save it, it's going to inspect to see if that model by name is registered in the global. And if not, it'll just raise an exception and pass, or if it is, then it's going to fire this uh, two outgoing transaction method and it will then serialize it and stick it in that outgoing transaction table. Um, we also encrypt it for security purposes um, as, as you should. Um, yeah, so that takes care of everything that's happening on a client machine and everything that will happen in reverse on some remote server. And the next thing then is to handle the sort of file events, what's gonna happen there. 
So that process is started by one of our research assistants with their machine. They have a, we had several different interfaces, so, but it's basically just click, and then that will export all those outgoing transactions into a file. And then we use a, um, a module called Watchdog, which will just monitor a, um, a directory for any events. We had used this for some of the laboratory equipment that would drop uh, result files and just pick them up and pull them into a database. So this worked well here as well. And any sort of event, you just pass it um, an event handler. This is just some simple code coming from the um, from its own documentation. So we had different event handlers. One was to um, export the outgoing transactions to a file. Another one would be to transfer files to a, a remote system. So the file is created and then it can move to the remote system. And another one would be that as soon as a remote system file gets dropped into a directory, it then pulls it up into the incoming transaction model. So that takes care of database, file, get it across, into get the file across and then pull the file up there. So the watchdog is on a community server or it'll be on the final node, however many you want to have, but we only ever had client, community server, and then headquarters server. And then obviously on the last database or whatever, not the last one, but the incoming, there would be a post save signal that would then deserialize all your models as I described earlier. So that's kind of it. So I told you it wasn't a real shocking solution. And so what does it look like in the field? So this is actually some people working in the field. So you can see them with their little Mac Air there. They actually came with the table and the chair and the CD4 counter and all the um, equipment to collect blood and a cool box and everything they they would had everything with them as they were going in they have some discussion they collect the blood like that they pack it all up and and walk away and this whole process with the data collection the blood collection everything like that and the testing the counseling and everything that, that could take up to an hour hour and a half um, and in some cases we would have families of like 10 because old ladies would tell all their relatives to come <laughs> because they're, they're coming to, to participate in the research. Then we had trucks like this which were our data center and laboratories so when um, sorry when he finishes then he goes to this truck this is parked next to our laboratory but this would be parked also in the field and we have a laboratory there for him to bring in his blood specimens. They would then be processed, spun down. The data would be synch synchronized into our data center, which is just on the other end of the truck. Um, the lab technician would then see the data on the server that they're accessing, scan in the physical, um, the physical specimens to verify everything's okay. Then the research assistant would go back out to the next household and we're basically done. And then up here we had a little wireless bridge that would connect in some way to that tower that you saw earlier when the connection was available and the data would end up where we wanted it. So we did exactly that across 30 villages for four years. We would collect, serialize, find working internet, transfer, deserialize this whole process. And uh, we did our first um, enrollment in October of 2013 and got our first publication out in 2016 to show that Botswana actually had the best um, program available um, except for, I think Switzerland might have beat out with their 0.1 percent prevalence um, um, in the world. So, um, yeah and that's it that's what we did so thank you